So welcome back to another episode of the Osteoclast Plastering Series. Today I've got Nick Polterglue with me, another orthopedic registrar. And this is going to be a great video because we're going to go through all the general tips that we've picked up in our careers as orthopedic registrars. Uh, just everything from putting the cast on, how to finesse the cast, how to make life easier for yourself. And we'll be including some videos about how to do all those things. So this is a really important video to watch before making any cast. And we'll complement the other series that we have with specific cast applications. I think I'll start off, Nick, by talking about perhaps the preparation phase, and then we'll talk about putting the cast on and the aftercare. In the preparation phase, uh, what are the kind of things that go through your head before you put the plaster on? Yeah, look, there's a, there's a couple of things that you can do here to make your life easier when you're putting the cast on. And the first is uh, preparing yourself uh, to put that on with having enough people around, so lots of hands. Find anyone that's around in the emergency department or on the ward, wherever you're putting the plaster on, just to give you a, a helping hand. The second thing is making sure that you've got all of the appropriate gear with you. You want anything that's going to help position the limb in a more appropriate position. So a bit of a bump for, for knees, below knee casting. You want to have your padding. So Webrel in this hospital here, which is really malleable and you can tear it. You've got your plaster of Paris, your crepe. And you also want to make sure you've got some tape around. And you want to cut the tape before you get started and make sure that you've got them just lying around in an easily accessible area. Always have more of what, um, of what you think you need having, uh, hanging around and then have your water in the tub. When you start off, make sure the water is nice and cold to begin with. It gives you a longer time for the plaster to set. Probably the next point then, Anton, would be to run through uh, in your own mind exactly how you're going to put the cast on. So have it uh, from step-by-step -step process in your head. It helps you make sure you haven't forgotten anything, reminds you of any of the tips and tricks that hopefully you pick out from this video uh, when you're going ahead and putting it on. I, I still do that today. I still, before I do a cast or even a procedure somewhere else, I go through my head, what are the steps? And I think, what am I going to grab for each step? And is it actually here? Because if it's not there, you don't want to find out mid-cast. We've all been there. And you won't go to grab the crepe or the tape for the end of it. And you, it's not there. And you've got to try and like get someone else to hold the leg and go back and move. So if you have that process of going through all the steps, then you're less likely to forget stuff, I think. Definitely helps if you have more people around as well. If you do forget something, but go through it at the start before, yep. before you get started. Uh, and finally, make sure you know, you're wearing the right protective stuff. If you've got gown and gloves on, uh, unless you're happy to get plaster all over your shirt at work, uh, make sure you have that stuff available too. And especially if you're using synthetic cast materials, which you might in a fracture clinic, probably not so much in ED, you have to wear gloves because that stuff sticks to you. Most it's... people make that mistake once in their life yeah. and that's it. <laughs> all right, so let's go through some of the other tips then for when you're putting a plaster on. In terms of getting the patient ready for your plaster, it's really important that you've got everything you need to position them. And for a ankle or below knee plaster, it can be helpful to have one of those big um, cushion bumps, or you can roll up some towels to help elevate the thigh. It's also important for an ankle, for a um, hand fracture, to look for rings for the patient. I don't know if you've come across that before. Yeah, you... definitely. And you see the paper, uh, people when their hands are all swollen up after they've had an injury, they leave their rings on, and it starts putting a tourniquet around their finger. So you want to get it off as early as possible. And yeah, as soon as the patient come comes with a fracture anywhere in the upper limb, because a, lo a lot of bruises given from upper limb, proximal fractures mm. can track down and get swelling, just take the ring off straight away while you can. Um, there are tricks you can do to do that. So Nick, how do you keep the patient comfortable uh, for your cast application? Because most of these people are going to have fractures, right? Yeah, look, I think the main thing to make sure is that you've given them some form of analgesia beforehand. Um, and if that's not appropriate, or you're ready to put the plaster on straight away, you can use a little bit of sedation, uh, some happy gas downstairs in the emergency department, but making sure they're really comfortable before you start, because it is a, it is going to be a bit sore. You are applying it for a reason. Uh, they've got a fracture. I think, yeah, I think it's important. So everything from oral analgesia, you can give them oral or even IV Panadol. You can give them oral anti-inflammatories or even paracoxib IV. And then everything else, so your options there include hematoma blocks, which are injections into the fracture site of local anesthetic. You can use uh, Beer's block, which is a, um, a tourniquet applied to the arm. Local anesthetic is actually put into the venous system and it blocks the arm. You can do sedation where you're not doing any nerve block per se or local, but you're making the patient um, in a semi-conscious state where they um, are less likely to feel pain and be un uncomfortable during the procedure. I think those last few things are obviously really important. If you're talking about doing a reduction of a fracture in the emergency department, uh, when you're just applying a cast without needing to do too much manipulating, you don't often need to use those mm. more um, extreme uh, versions of analgesia. Alrighty, and 
I guess don't forget, inspect the skin. So make sure mm-hmm. there's no cuts, scrapes, secret open fractures, which you've missed, baby. So make sure there's all the skin's intact. And if there's a little scab, give it a good clean. Make sure there's no um, open fracture. And a good tip for finding an open fracture, I think, is look for bleeding that doesn't really settle down. Um, any break in the skin, always report that to the orthopedic registrar that you're referring to. And if you look closely in a real open fracture, you can actually see little droplets of fat that sort of glisten. I don't know if you've seen that before. Mm. Um, that confirms basically that it's an open fracture because you don't have that normal blood. That definitely changes patient management if they've got an open fracture. So a very important thing to look out for. Okay, so Anton, you're up to putting the cast on now. You've gone through all of those pre-step uh, phases. How are you going to position the patient for this? I, th- I think, and I've said this lots of times before, but I think the most important thing for positioning is that before you put your padding on, you put the limb in the position that you want it to be at the end of the casting and you keep it there for the whole cast. If you have the limb positioned in a different position to how you're going to have it when you finish your plaster then when you do your molding or you bend the wrist you're going to get all these ripples developing on the underside where you flex it so in preference you want to have the hand in the position that you're going to have it in at the end when you start applying even your padding even worse for the elbow if you started out in extension and you realize oh i want to bend it up to 90 you're going to get these really big indentations of cast and padding material and so really important at the very start, put the foot or the hand where you want it to be at the end before you start. And again, that just get, comes back to having lots of hands and having mm-hmm. medical students, nurses, uh, you know, PSA or patient service um, officers, uh, other doctors um, to hold everything in the position that you'd like it to be in. And it's easier said than done. Obviously, we work a lot in theatres where there's a lot of access to staff and resources. It's very different in emergency, but even if you have medical students or someone that can give you a hand, that's very helpful. Okay, so you've got them in the position you want. Uh, do you just start rolling on the, the vel band, the crave? What, yeah, what are so some of the points here? I think the points here is that in fracture clinics, people might use a stocking, but in practice in theatre and in emergency, we'll just go straight to putting mm. padding on. And the key part of that putting padding on, and it's hard to describe it, is unraveling as you unroll. That's the first step that people get caught up on and get stuck on. It makes it very difficult to do. And that just means that as I'm unrolling the valve band, and same goes for plaster, uh, so as I'm unrolling the padding, I want the roll to be opening up as I circumduct the um, limb. And what I don't want to do is be doing it the other way around, which means I'm kind of trying to unravel and pull it around, and it just doesn't feel very natural and makes it difficult. Any more tips and tricks when you're actually applying the valve band? Yes, so you can see in the casting materials video that we've got different types of padding and Valband's one of them. You've also got Webrel, which is probably one that tears a bit easier and Softband, which is a bit more space filling and probably doesn't conform as well. So we typically prefer to use Webrel. And I think one of the key parts is padding the bony prominences. So I wanna make sure that, for example, in the ankle, I've padded the calcaneum and the uh, malleoli uh, well and the tibial tuberosity. And likewise for our wrist, making sure that the styloids of the ulnar styloid and the radial styloid are well padded. Yeah, I think that's particularly important in diabetic patients as well that might have peripheral neuropathy uh, because you can end up with these pressure sores over the top of these bony prominences and if you haven't padded it well enough, you won't know about it until you take the cast off after six weeks and that can be a pretty big issue. Yep. But on the flip side, you want to have too much padding, especially if you're doing a reduction maneuver. So there's padding, if you're doing a reduction, probably should be about two layers maximum, which means each time you unravel, you're only covering up the previous layer by half, therefore leaving just two layers at the end. Uh, it's different if you're putting a resting slab for someone who's going to theatre or um, has an undisplaced fracture that just needs some gentle mobilisation, there you can probably be a bit more generous with your padding. But if you're doing a reduction where you really want to hold the position through the cast, you don't want to have too much padding because that just leaves room for the fracture to displace into. There's nowhere to hide as well. You can definitely see on an x-ray if there's too much padding um, and can be a reason why we might have to change the cast if we're concerned it's going to fall around. While we're doing the padding, uh, application. We also want to make sure that we're not getting bunch ups. And it's really easy to get bunch ups on conical shaped limbs. So in particular, someone with a muscly forearm or a big calf that goes down into a narrow ankle. Uh, what you might find is that as you're going, because it's not a cylinder in shape, you get these extra dog ears. So what I find helps is just to give some gentle tearing. So I pull open the webral, for example. Um, so that way I conform better and I keep wrapping around. And that tearing just means I'm less likely to get um, little rivets and things underneath. I think one of the other tips is that you can extend the web rule on uh, longer than what you're actually going to put the cast on. So, for example, up to the cubital fossa in the elbow, and then you can make two cuts with some scissors on either side uh, to allow it to fold back over the top. And that just makes it a little bit uh, neater and more comfortable for the patient at the end.
And I find that it's really helpful for me as a visual marker of where I want my plaster to finish. In particular, in the hand, where it's really common to go too far and make it really difficult for the patient to move the fingers. I'll make my cut on the sides or my tear with my hands down to where I want the plaster to finish. And when I see the skin, I'm not likely to keep plastering mm. over it. It's just a visual reminder for me not to go too far. And again, I'll put one layer down, I can fold the two ends over, and then I can do more plaster over the top. What I don't want to have is my plaster to go beyond my padding, because then it'll contact the skin and it'll be very rough for them. There are tips and tricks you can use also for back slabs. And specifically, one of the things people find difficult is that the back slabs always fall off, even, most commonly for something like an ankle. And if you have wet hands and a wet plaster, you can actually use the hands to push the plaster off the plaster onto the padding and get it to stick. And therefore you can just easily put your bandage on while the plaster sits in the perfect position, eliminating, eliminating that need for the extra person to be holding up while it all falls apart. If that's not possible, and sometimes that's the case if it's a heavy cast or a non-ideal situation with um, the amount of people you have to help you, you can just put the slab onto the sole of the foot, for example, and start bandaging it. And as you go along, you can put it back against the patient. And that can be very helpful in a situation where you don't have many hands and it's falling off. If you want to be friendly to your colleagues in the wound clinic who are taking these plasters off, or even in theatre if you're putting it on an emergency, it's a good idea to just wrap your plaster slab in a layer of valband or under padding. And that just means the crate won't stick to it as much and it's a lot easier to unravel without having plaster dust fly everywhere or having to get the scissors out. And Nick, when it comes to actual cylinder casts, so full cast, do you have any practical tips for people putting those on? So I think one of the first things to do is to be able to apply it in, uh, in a way that doesn't let the plastic cylinder fall out of the plaster. To do this, you can pinch both ends of the plaster and give it a twist and then you can unravel as you unroll and it's a way of keeping all the plaster in one spot as opposed to falling off. Uh, the second thing to do would be to consider when you're going around contours of the arm to avoid the dog ears developing in the plaster. Uh, you can provide a bit of extra tension uh, holding it in place and then laying it down on the plaster as opposed to pulling it um, around and bunching it up. I find that really helpful because like we said before about the padding, a lot of people have cone shaped limbs and that just takes that excess out from creating little you know, bunched up parts under your cast. And we all have been in those situations where that plastic cylinder falls out of the plaster mm. roll and then you're holding this little wet mush of nothing and it's really hard to apply. So I find actually putting my fingers, so my thumb and my index finger on either side as well just helps keep it stay on track. But I like that twisting trick. I'm going to try that myself. So Anton, one of the really common things that were that orthopedic registrars ask other doctors to do is to mould the cast. What, what does moulding mean? Yeah, moulding we describe as a way of keeping the fracture in its anatomic position if it's been reduced or even just stopping it from going any further in a fracture that you're happy just to immobilize in place. The key thing here is do not use the pads of your fingers. A lot of people tend to hold it like they would of something else and use their fingertips like a pincer grip and they actually indent the plaster and you can't undo that indentation once it's set and that can cause pressure sores. So whenever you're handling plaster, be it a full cast or a slab, you strictly want to be using your palms and open fingers only and just smoothly molding it without any indentations from fingers. And whilst you may be very aware of this, your assistants might not be, so it's important to explain that to them. In particular, someone that might be trying to help hold the slab on for you might be using their thumb and putting a bit of indentation into it. So you have to really be vigilant about it and ask people to um, just use their palms. And particularly with ankle fractures, that's a reason why ankles can re-dislocate again if you're pushing on the back of the cast. So a really important thing to think about there. Yep. And I guess that leads into how do we reduce and mold fractures. We talk a lot about three-point molding, and it's not something that's understood well. And this is applies mainly to people doing full casts, but also to sort of what we call three-quarter back slabs, which do have a palmar and dorsal component to it, for example, in a wrist. And what this means in our minds is that you have one pivot point proximal to the fracture, and you're trying to bend or banana the plaster on the other side with one fingerprint or um, pressure point distal to the fracture and another one proximal to it. So you're effectively creating a seesaw and trying to hold the plaster down. This is a step that's often done poorly. Um, the common mistakes I find is that you underestimate once the plaster is on where the actual wrist joint is, where your fracture is, for example, in a wrist fracture, and you end up putting your volar um, pressure too distal. I think that's a very common mistake. Mm -hmm. And you end up putting your wrist in the extreme flexion rather than actually pushing on the distal radius 
dorsally, which is a more helpful method and it's a safer position to have the patient in. So you don't have to flex the wrist to an extreme position. You can just do it um, by putting pressure on the distal dorsal radius and proximal dorsal radius. So we've done our molding and now we want to just do some finishing touches. What can we do, Nick, to, to spruce up the cast, make it look good for the crowds? Well, that's got to be the most important thing, isn't it, when they're leaving the emergency department with their cast for everyone to sign. But the thing that I like to think about here mostly is around the edges of the cast to not make them as sharp. And so if you've got really wet hands with a bit of plaster on it, you can just smooth uh, with your finger and thumb around the edges. That makes it a nice smooth contour. Uh, it doesn't dig into patients as much. The other thing you can do is uh, you can get a glove and run it up and down the cast and that uh, smooths it out even more, makes it nice and shiny, it's good to sign. Yep. And don't forget just getting some more water in your hands and keeping them wet and just doing some more flat hand moulding can actually also help um, keep everything together and take off any excess plaster at the end. Okay, so cast is on, uh, it's all looking really good, patient's ready to, to go home from the emergency department. What are some of the things we do from here? Well, the key things are, one, to give the patient some specific post-plaster instructions. Ideally, this is verbal and written, and most emergency departments will have a handout that you can give people to look out for the red flags, so to speak, about what to look out for. We've made a separate video about what to do there, um, where we have our plaster technician take us through what they normally talk to patients about after they put casts on, so you can watch that here. The other part, which is the follow-up part you need to organise, is where are they going to get seen next, and do they need another x-ray? And most patients will have a check x-ray in a one to two weeks, um, sometimes earlier if we request it. And you need to make sure they've got a referral in place to the appropriate clinic or fracture clinic if required. We hope those tips helped you and make you do nicer casts in the future. Um, please drop a line below if you have any other tips that you'd like to share. Thanks. Mm -hmm.